Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're about to begin a new series on the book of Jeremiah in the Bible. And this lesson will focus primarily on the first chapter of Jeremiah, the prophetic calling of Jeremiah, the circumstances and so forth in, in connection with that calling. This is lesson number one, of course, you would say, for October 3 of 2015. So before we begin, we'd like to ask you, I hope you have your Bible handy, but we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. <clears throat> Our wonderful Father, we've come now to open a new section of Scripture to think about your friend Jeremiah. Some have called him the weeping prophet. We could certainly understand that having lived through three sieges and three uh, destructions of Jerusalem, it's not hard to understand why he would be called a weeping prophet, and especially when we consider the response he got from all the people he was supposed to talk to. Help us to understand what you want us to know and want us to learn from this experience with Jeremiah as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we already mentioned, we're going to focus on the call of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1. Uh, maybe you hadn't thought about it like this, but we know more about the life of Jeremiah than we know about any other Old Testament prophet, because his life is just interwoven in and out, in and out through the whole book. Um, that information makes it easier to understand his work as a prophet. We know that from, from later comments that he was a revered prophetic figure. So what do we know about the world in the days of Jeremiah? Pretty turbulent. Very turbulent, as a matter of fact. The very year, or plus or minus a year or so, of Jeremiah's beginning his prophetic ministry, Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, began what turned out to be the conquest of the world by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And Nabopolassar did a lot of it, and Nebuchadnezzar followed up, and they conquered the world, just as Jeremiah was beginning his work. That was about 627 B.C., or maybe 626 B.C. And what do you mean by he was beginning his work? Was he a priest? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. He was raised in a priestly family, but now he's called by God, and we're going to talk about the call very specifically in a moment. He was called by God to be a prophet. So now we're going to talk about somebody who is theoretically a priest and a prophet. So we'll see what that might imply. Uh, he lived through the three conquests of Jerusalem. And by the time we got to the end of his ministry, Jerusalem was left nothing but a pile of rubble. I mean, just think about it. I mean, think about our country. Suppose you were there and it was your job to protect Washington, D.C. How would you feel about your work if you're getting down near the end of your life and the whole place is just absolutely flattened. There's not a building left with, you know, more than a few stones together. The Washington Tower is knocked down and, you know, what would you think? So just, just remember now, there were three times when the Babylonians came and conquered Jerusalem. The first time they were trying to do it in a sort of gentleman's way, when in 605 B.C. they just collected some of the very best of the young men, people like Daniel and his three friends, uh, from the royal line and from the most intelligent of the young men, and took them off to Babylon. And the idea was that they were supposed to be representatives of, of Judaism and to, it, at Babylon, and they were supposed to represent Babylon back to Judaism. Mm. They were supposed to be like ambassadors uh, for Judaism in the, in the capital of Babylonia. Then the next time, they got so disgusted with the Jews for their rebellion and so forth that they came and in the days of Ezekiel, they just, they just rampaged through the country. They just hauled everybody off and took them off into Babylonian captivity. There was all, virtually nothing left. And Ezekiel, as I mentioned, was taken at that time and ended up in a place somewhere south of Babylon. And finally, after the Jews had rebelled the third time, Nebuchadnezzar came back and said, that's it. 588, 587, somewhere about that time, 
Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going I'm to flatten Jerusalem. There's not going to be anything to come back to. So, um, how did they flatten it? Did they actually bring workers in there to, yes. to, yeah. to scatter all the boulders and all the bricks and a stuff all over the place? I mean, we, we can go and still see a few walls way down low buried, but basically they said they didn't. Go read, read, read uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and see what they came back to. Yeah. They torched the crops to rip, rip they, out the orchards. They burned everything they could burn. They wanted to make sure this group of people are not going to rebel again. Sounds like the Middle East of today. I mean, it doesn't seem Vaguely, like Vaguely, doesn't it? Doesn't seem like much has changed. <laughs> well, if you can remember something about the prophetic ministry of Jeremiah, you think it was a success or a failure? It was in many ways. He accomplished many things, but depends on how you look at it. Well. Let's read a few verses from Jeremiah 1 so we have the general picture. Um, actually, I'm going to start from verse one, uh, Jeremiah 1, verse 1. This book is the account of what was said by Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of the town of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. So he's a priest. He comes from Anathoth, nearby Jerusalem, actually in the territory of Benjamin. Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that in a moment. He's a descendant of... Well, we'll find out a little bit later. He's a descendant of Nardo. His father was Hilkiah, but one of his ancestors was probably Abiathar, and we'll talk about him. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah in the 13th year that Josiah, son of Ammon, was king of Judah. And he spoke to him again when Josiah's son Jehoiakim was king. After that, the Lord spoke to him many times until the 11th year of the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah. In the fifth month of that year, the people of Jerusalem were taken into exile. So that's when the city is flat. So the call of Jeremiah, so that was in general introduction. The Lord said to me, I chose you before I gave you life. Before you were born, I selected you to be a prophet to the nations. I answered, Sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say that you're too young, but go to the people I send you to and tell them everything I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them, for I will be with you to protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my lips and said to me, Listen, I am giving you the words you must speak. Today I give you authority over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. We'll come back to that verse later. So he has two visions. The Lord asked me, Jeremiah, what do you see? I answered, a branch of an almond tree. You're right, the Lord said, and I am watching to see that my words come true. Now, in Hebrew, we, we can't bring this over into English, but in Hebrew, the word for almond and the word for watching come from the same root. So it's, it's a play on words. Here. <coughs> then the Lord spoke, again, spoke to me again. What else do you see? He asked. I answered, I see a pot boiling in the north and it's about to tip over this way. Guess what that's talking about? He said to me, destruction will boil over from the north on all who live in this land, because I'm calling all the nations in the north to come. <coughs> what nations would those be? Assyria and Babylon. Assyria and Babylon, yeah. Because I'm calling... Um, the the reason why it was from the north, they had to come in from the north, because yeah. if they came directly across, eat due, oh. due west... It's just all terrible desert yeah, out yeah. there. So that's the Fertile Crescent. So they would travel up around north like this, and then they would come down, come from the north. Their kings will set up their thrones at the gates of Jerusalem and around its walls and also around the other cities of Judah. I will punish my people because they have sinned. They have abandoned me. So why does God punish his people? They have abandoned me, have offered sacrifices to other gods, and have made idols and worshiped them. Get ready, Jeremiah. Go and tell them everything I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them now, or I will make you even more afraid when you are with them. Listen, Jeremiah. Everyone in this land, the kings of Judah, the officials, the priests, and the people, will be against you. But today I'm giving you the strength to resist them. You will be like a fortified city, 
an iron pillar, and a bronze wall. They will not defeat you, for I will be with you to protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay? Consider the fact that Jeremiah was called by God to give, a, uh, to give assistance to others and guidance to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. How do you think Jeremiah felt as he realized that the people of Judah almost overwhelmingly rejected everything he tried to teach them? The king, well, we're going we're gonna to get to the place where we find out that Jeremiah went to great expense and great effort with the help of Baruch, a scribe, to write all of his prophecies out. And what did the king do? He read, he, he, would, he would read a page or two, cut that page off and throw it in the fire. Read another page or two, cut the page off and throw it in, your fi in the fire. How would, you, that, how would that make you feel? That's a lot of work, too, to write all that stuff. Yeah. Then. But Jeremiah was not the only prophet <clears throat> trying to teach the children of Judah at that time in history. Remember, the northern kingdom of Israel has long since gone into captivity. hundred and... 20 years before this, or 100 years, depending on what part of what time in the life of Jeremiah you're talking about. During Jeremiah's lifetime, the following prophets were also active. Daniel, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Huldah, there's a lady there, Obadiah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. There are six other prophets besides Jeremiah. But Daniel was... Uh in Babylon. In Babylon. And who, who are the ones still here in, uh, with Jeremiah? Oh, the only ones who are not here with Jeremiah are, are Daniel and Ezekiel. Although we don't know for sure about Nahum. Nahum might have been already in captivity somewhere. When Jeremiah started his ministry, didn't King Josiah also begin a uh, sort of yes. reform from idolatry, we're trying to change him back from what his father and grandfather had yeah. set in place. Yeah. So that kind of helped him a little bit. Yes. You know? yeah. Now were all these guys running around in Jerusalem here, or were they spread all over the country and never got together for any conferences or we meetings or anything? We don't know that for sure. Of course, we know that Daniel was taken off probably mm -hmm. around the age of 17 to Babylon, so he probably wasn't there. Ezekiel was taken sometime later, and but probably still when he was fairly young. We don't know. We just don't know. How many of them even knew each other? We don't know. So how many prophets did you say it was all together? Seven all together. Seven, of course. Active <laughs> at the same time, yes. Mm -hmm. Good number. Yep. And what do you think they were all trying to do? Trying to get the people to stop sinning, right? It's interesting the age that uh, they are. They were very young. Mm -hmm. So they lacked experience, they lacked the uh, understanding of the scriptures and the study, the amount of time to, to study and all. Mm -hmm. So, so, so if, they, if they stopped sinning, what would they stop doing? Well, he mentioned some things. Stop killing people. Mm -hmm. Stop worshiping idols. Treat the poor, the widows, and the orphans better. Those things are mentioned very specifically. That's pretty well it. Well, those uh, I'm not. I guess that's the not, idle things that would be yeah. that were pretty encompassing, but yeah, and and you know what they were doing in those heathen temples up there that uh, yeah. the, the groves at the top of the hills where they're worshiping the fertility cult gods, mm -hmm. burning their children. Mm. Mm -hmm. But when people, I mean, it seems like you know, the fact that God sent all these prophets to try to change the course of events seems to indicate clearly that. God's judgment falling upon them was not inevitable. I mean, why would he waste his time sending seven prophets unless there was at least the possibility of some change? But, as we know, when people are accustomed to doing evil, change isn't easy. How many things are we doing now that we used to think were evil some years ago? Mm -hmm. Didn't we stop doing that we think? No, hmm. how many things are we doing now that oh, we used I to see. think were wrong? Who do you mean we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 w I was trying to leave that open. 
Um, <laughs> look at look at look at society. Culture or the church. Look, look at look at our nation. Look at the world. Look at our nation. Look at what's being done in government and in, in, in Supreme Court and so forth like that. Well, well look at the evening news and you catch some yeah, of exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Some would say just look at the pulpit. We've got these women in the pulpit. Yeah, there you go. You see? <laughs> Yeah, we, they just pass a rule that uh, homosexuals can teach scouts. Now yeah. you cannot stop them starting today. Yeah. They have to. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, take that, but I mean, even coming down to the church level, I, I, I know many things that are going on in the church right now that we used to think when I was a kid that those things are forbidden. Mm -hmm. They were done in hiding. <laughs> I don't think people have changed so much. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it too. Oh, yeah. It's all out in the open oh, yeah. because they're not scared yeah. like they used to be. Maybe that was the problem here. Maybe they weren't scared. Well, it kind of looks like it. Of course, well, we, we should they have been scared? Well, but of course, we often say here that in our conversations that you're not supposed to be motivated because you're scared. No. But other times, the Holy Spirit worked through angels. I mean, how did God give these messages to Jeremiah? We don't know that much about inspiration, but sometimes God seemed to speak directly to the prophet. Sometimes he works the Holy Spirit, who in turn speaks to an angel, and the angel speaks to the prophet. And there's, and sometimes, like in 1 Kings 19, 12, God speaks with a still, small voice. By the way, the person that gets the message from a still small voice is almost ready for translation. You know, we mentioned in our lesson last week, as part of the lesson that uh, Jesus, when he was facing the cross there in Gethsemane, got uh, apparently got very discouraged almost to the point of death. These kinds of things affect Jeremiah, and did they, they, they face these kinds of things as well? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> how could the how could that happen when God said, you know, this is the way you're going to be. You're going to be a big pillar and a wall of brass. And so, mm -hmm. how how would how would he get discouraged like that? Well, I mean, what would well, how would you feel if God says, okay, I'm I'm giving you a message to the town where you live. Let's say it's Loma Linda here. And you work all your life, you work your tail off under very difficult circumstances. I mean, think of sieges and other things going on like that. And basically everything you tell people, they seem to laugh at you, or ignore you, or abuse you. And you call say, your oh, that's, names. that's just fine. What? Call your names. Yeah. Call you, t tell everybody this guy's stupid, he's crazy. It, that, um, God had to give him extra power because I don't think anybody could take that. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that stand up for what's right now and all of a sudden they kind of disappear or they back off. But he didn't back off. He never backed off. Yeah. Do you, do you think uh, Seventh-day Adventists have a popular message to give to the world today? Do they want to hear what we have to say? Well, when you say popular, that means <laughs> it's popular. It's not popular with them because they don't know it. I mean, do they like to? They li seem to like to hear it. I'm, I'm not sure we even know what the message is. Well, that's part of the problem. Yeah, it depends where you Good are, point. who you listen to. How many Adventists are taking Ellen White's message seriously? Smaller and smaller percentage. Yeah. Okay, well, let's. Let's look back to Jeremiah again. The story of Jeremiah's ancestors is told in 1 Kings 1. I'm going to turn over there, but I'm not going to read it. King David was now a very old man, and although his servants covered him with blankets, he could not keep warm. So his officials said to him, Your Majesty, let us find a young woman to stay with you and take care of you. She will lie close to you and keep you warm. A search is made all over Israel for a beautiful young woman, and in, and in Shunem they found such a woman named Abishag and brought her to the king. She was very beautiful and waited on the king and took care of him, but he did not have, did not have intercourse with her. That's the beginning of our story. Okay. So, ugly woman couldn't give him more. 
sounds like the description. He already has, he already has a whole bunch of wives. <laughs> this description, this sounds like he had congestive heart failure. He was, he was beyond that. <laughs> well, the reason that's important is because he's getting old enough so he's losing touch with what's going on in the world. Oh. And his oldest son, Adonijah, decided it was time for himself for, for, for himself to declare his kingship. So he arranges a big celebration, and a number of important people, including Joab, a relative of David's, in fact, several relatives of David, and including a man by the name of one of the priests whose name was Abiathar, said, well, obviously, this, he's, the, he's the oldest son of King David. He must be the next appointed heir. He must be the next one to be king. Let's give our support to him. Maybe our, our, our political futures will rise. Well, Solomon, I mean, it turns out that David had already promised um, Bathsheba that Solomon, her son, was going to be the next king. And apparently that information was not widely known. So as uh, Adonijah is celebrating over there, uh, Bathsheba comes running and the prophet comes and tells, Nathan tells Bathsheba and the two of them go into David and said, look what's happening. And David said, no, we have to make Solomon king. And so he declares Solomon king and puts him on his donkey to ride downtown with a big celebration and so forth. And so David, and, well Solomon basically, when he becomes king, throws Abiathar out because he tried to support his older brother mm -hmm. as a potential king. Is that a reason why Abiathar should be thrown out? It's kind of hard to know what his real motives were. Yeah. Uh, they're just kind of describing what happened. Mm -hmm. Abiathar yeah. is a, he's a priest? Is he a high he's a, priest? He's one of the high, he was a high priest, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is uh, Solomon doing well, throwing any of the priests That's out? That's the question. And Abiathar is, is basically exiled to a town three miles northeast of Jerusalem. And that's Jeremiah's hometown. That's why we're talking about this. He's well, probably a descendant of Abiathar. Not only that, but we read in the Bible that um, Solomon kind of got rid of a lot of enemies during that time. It was kind of like the godfather <laughs> type act activity. They went around and picked out all these people and they just disappeared. Some of them he did so because David told him to. Mm -hmm. Well we know that Jeremiah had priestly training. So can we see reviewing once again what we know from the Old Testament that God calls what kind of people to be prophets? Well we know about shepherds, we know about people who are rabbis, we know about farmers, we know about priests, we know about I mean a member of Levitical, some comments about Jeremiah now from Prophets and Kings, page 407. A member of the Levitical priesthood, Jeremiah had been trained from childhood for holy service. In those happy years of preparation, he little realized that he had been ordained from birth to be a prophet unto the nations. And when the divine call came, he was overwhelmed with a sense of his unworthiness. Ah, Lord God, he exclaimed, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. Jeremiah 1, 5 and 6. So how do you feel about that first interchange between God and Jeremiah? Well, doesn't that kind of give you some evidence or indication that, that all this message wasn't from man? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a young child or a young person that's inexperienced, doesn't know very much, and all of a sudden he's whipping out all these these proclamations from God, and that would give you evidence that that's from God. Well, what were, what were priests supposed to be doing in Jeremiah's day? Giving a message from the Lord to the people. Yeah. Teaching the people. Well, not, yeah. yeah, they were supposed to be the moral and spiritual leaders, weren't they? Sure. Yeah. Um, now, we need to understand something here a little bit. What territory in the land of Canaan was given to the tribe of Levi? Now, the Levites were the priests, right? Were they given any territory? No. Well, that's not quite the right answer. What territory were they given? They were given a, a fairly good-sized territory right around Jerusalem. 
because they were the ones supposed to care for and, 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 and take care of the basically the temple. Then there were 48 cities scattered through Canaan where that were given to the Levites. So some of them went here, some went there. So they were scattered out oh. through all the tribes. So this was one of the, Anathoth was one of the towns that was in the tribe of Benjamin. So, but I, I'm just mentioning this because the fact that Jeremiah comes from a, the territory of Benjamin doesn't mean he was a Benjaminite. He was one of the Levites that was assigned to one of the towns in the tribe of, so this was a little carve out for the Levites in the Benjaminite territory. Weren't they supposed to service all of the tribes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So what do you suppose it means to be a priest and a prophet at the same time? Think about this. You know, we have the, we have the civil authorities, the kings and all their armies and all that kind of stuff, and then we have what would be called you know, the, the religious establishment, that would be the priests and so forth like this. And the prophets were always kind of outliers, right? They're like spies almost. If you think about a military campaign, these are the guys that run around and they're, you know, you don't know where they are they're, and they pop up over here and they do something and they pop over here and they do, you know. The prophets are sort of an unruly lot, right? <laughs> well, I never quite thought of it as that way, but yes. I always figured they had homes and Circuit, yeah, circuit preacher. The circuit preacher. But shouldn't the prophet have been kind of like a supreme priest? In other words, he he would have been the priest. He would have known the, <clears throat> the scriptures and all. Yeah. And then on top of that, yeah. he was directed by God to do it. I mean, it was like. Yeah. But if you got, look through, the, if you look through the prophets the Old Testament prophets, you find out that one of the main targets of their preaching was the priests. Very often yeah. the priests were some of the most serious criminals because they were the ones who were supposed to be leading the way. So what about Amos? Wasn't he a, a farmer? He was a farmer. I mentioned that yeah. there were sheep herders and farmers and people like that became, became prophets. And what about Jonah? People like Jonah. Uh, what about Habakkuk? He's having an argument with God. You know, what do you suppose Jeremiah meant when he said, I'm too young? <coughs> now remember, how too old, too inexperienced. Yeah. How, how, how old were the priests supposed to be before they began to minister? Hey. They were, before they could do anything at all, they were supposed to be 20. Before they could do any teaching and leading out, they were supposed to be 30. So would this mean, presumably, that Jeremiah was less than 30? <clears throat> well, you can look at it that way, but it could be that he felt unworthy because he didn't think he was smart enough. Well, I mean, that, could, yeah, that would bring the same response, wouldn't it? Would, would it cause him to say, I'm too young? Mm -hmm. maybe. No, maybe. Were there other Bible writers that had the same kind of response? Moses. Look. look Look at we have Moses in Exodus four, um, when didn't God say called he was him. Too young. No, oh. eighty <laughs> years old. You think he was too young? <clears throat> Look at Isaiah six five. I said, "There's no hope for me. I'm doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful, and I live among I live among a people whose every word is sinful. And yet, with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." That was Isaiah's response, and of course, God touched his lips with what? A coal from off the altar, right? We, we already talked about Jeremiah. Look at Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. From Paul, who is called to be an apostle, did not come from human beings or by human means, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from death. So, in what ways were the experiences of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Moses similar? We've already looked at that briefly. And they, none of them felt like they were, I mean, the 80-year-old and the kids. They just didn't feel like they were, they were qualified. They couldn't speak. That was, that was one of the main things. God says, don't you know how I, I'm the one who made your mouth. <laughs> can't, I, can't I tell you what to say? So when it was done and God actually started, he started acting as a prophet, was he reluctant in what he had to say? Or was he uncertain about his call? No. How do we know he wasn't uncertain about his call? 
because of what he did, he went forward. Did he do like 40 years? His ministry lasted 40 years, yeah, no? About 40 years. About 40 years. Yeah, That's but a he long said, time. The word of the Lord has come to me. Mm. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Do we have a clear message from the Lord in 2015? I do. If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> well, other people have <laughs> said that before you. <coughs> okay. Well, how would you feel if God, I mean, some of us are a little older and some of us are younger. How would we feel if God suddenly touched us, tapped us on the shoulder and said, I've chosen you to be my, my special messenger to everyone around you? Well, it depends on how firm the tap. <laughs> you want me to knock you flat on the floor? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure that with the information that we have that he doesn't he doesn't he's tap doing. tap a little bit and depending upon our response depends on how more firm he he taps. That, that's that was one of the questions I was going to get to, so let's let's come up right now. How did how did Jeremiah know for sure it was God speaking to him? Because that would be part of the question, right? Maybe I'm the one that's tapping you on the shoulder. Well, do we know he was he was a he was called from the right person? Yeah, was this was this an angel that showed up, like uh, with Isaiah? I, no, God Himself showed up. It says. Well, well, I mean that's that's the question. Are we going to be skeptical about this? I mean, Jeremiah spends the rest of his life saying, God said, the word of the Lord came to me. Do we believe that or don't we? Well, it's different if there's a bright light at night or <laughs> if lie. you just read something in the scriptures. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what, would it help yeah, if... Would you it help came if, with a sunburn out. <laughs> would it help if God told you... I chose you while you were still being formed in your mother's womb. I don't recall hearing any voices like that. Yes, he said, <laughs> verse 5, it says, before you were formed. Before you were formed, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, it's interesting, just in passing a little trivia here, that word formed there is exactly the same word that God used in, when he says he formed Adam from the dust, from the clay, and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. Same word. I guess I can take assurance in the fact that because I haven't had any bright lights or heard any voices, then I haven't been called like Jeremiah. Hmm. That's probably fair. It, you're not called at least like Jeremiah. Doesn't mean you aren't called. I think we're all called, but maybe not the same kind of... God hasn't assigned you to go and preach in Washington, D.C. or any place else near there. Well, that's a nice, that's kind of a relief. <laughs> okay, good. Well, Satan's not going to ask us to go out and talk about God, so... He's going to do that himself. Good point. And he's going to send other false prophets. Yeah, he will. He's going to send his false... Matthew 24, there's going to be false prophets, false messiahs. But the, what their message is will not be... Yeah, okay, different story. Yeah. True. Biblical. So how do you feel about God knowing your future? I have no problem with that. No problem yeah. with that? No, absolutely not. What would you do if you knew your future? Well, that's just it. I would say I would have a different idea if you knew my future. <laughs> but God's, okay. I'm clear, I'm okay with that. You're thankful he's the only one who knows your future. <laughs> it does bother me a little bit if I, if I, if if uh, he knows my future and 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 I'm not getting there, you're not getting there. If I'm not meeting my future, would a person change their course in life if they knew there was no pie in the sky? What do you mean pie in the sky? Well, that's uh, some people well, talk about this. for for us individually or for anybody. Yeah, so it, it, it's a gen general <coughs> question. I mean, there's a. Uh, Jim and I and some others of us, you might know, uh, there's a gentleman we knew who used to do thinking a lot about this kind of stuff, and he was attending a major university here in Southern California with a very unreligious kind of environment, 
and he ran into a guy and at one point was one of his classmates and found out who found out that he was a Christian. And this guy just loved to rib him and give him a bad time. And so one time he met him and he said, okay, let's just assume temporarily that there's a 50, I believe that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm, I mean, I'm going to, God is going to resurrect me. He's going to take me to heaven and I'm going to live forever with him. You believe that when you die, it's all over. You're, nothing's ever going to happen again. So let's say, say there's a 50% chance that you're right and there's a 50% chance that I'm right. If you're right, then we're both going to go to the same place. It's not going to matter. If I'm right, then you are going to die and you're going to be sorry that you're dying. You're going to know the truth. I'm going to be enjoying things in heaven. And the, the, his friend said, yeah, but look at all the fun times you're missing right now. And this guy had already had his share of the wildlife of, in this earth, and he just said, I have been there already. I have no intention. I would not go back to that even if there were no pie in the sky. And there was nothing more for the man to say. So, back to Jeremiah. Remember that in, in Jeremiah's day, he couldn't send an email message. He couldn't announce it. He couldn't even mail a letter. Uh, well, maybe. But letters weren't easy. Uh, he had to deliver most of his messages face to face. In fact, one time, God said, I want you to stand out there at the door of the temple and preach to those people coming and going. How would you feel about doing that? He wasn't, he wasn't saying nice, friendly things either. Well, God told Jeremiah, we read that earlier, that he was going to, going to make him strong. He was going to be like a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall. How did he pick out those things? What did he have in mind? Strength. Was, Strength? They were the strongest things probably they had to do in metallurgy. In those days? Mm -hmm. Beginning of the, well, in the middle of the Iron Age? Um, well, those things probably had some symbology to them. Perhaps yeah. a pillar would mean mm -hmm. um, what you were going to be teaching is uh, something that is strong enough to to hold up, you know, the country if it's mm -hmm. embraced. What what kind of symbols do you think God would use today? You'll be like an F thirty five. I just read. I guess they're about about to release the new kind of plane for the military. That's incredible. Um, atomic bomb. I, I don't know how, what what symbols would God use today. But an atomic bomb would be like a destructive thing. Yeah. It seems like He was telling things that would not penetrate. You will keep. You'll stay standing, and you'll be able to withstand. Maybe you'd say carbonite. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, <laughs> titanium, or maybe like the—I don't know what they call that. But you know, there's this building that the, the Israelis have built to house the Isaiah Scroll outside oh. of near Jerusalem. There, that's supposed to be able to withstand a direct hit by an atomic bomb. <laughs> well, what was Jeremiah's biggest threat? What was the biggest threat to the children of Judah in those days? He saw this, poly, bo this pot, boiling pot yeah. w from the north was about to tip over in their direction. What does that represent? They're going to get invaded. By? Assyrians. Assyrians and Babylonians, right? Yes. Yeah. Was he ever given a message to the Assyrians and the Babylonians? That, that would be the biggest political threat. Well, it there wasn't was just a political threat. If you, spend, if you end up spending, what, three and a half years confined inside the small walls of Jerusalem because there's a Babylonian, I mean, uh, yeah, there's a Babylonian army surrounding you, and if you, if you escape, they would kill you, and if you sit inside, you, everybody's absolutely starving to the point where they're eating each other. Well, but... That was kind of fun, fun wasn't it? But if they had changed their ways, well, if they yeah. had listened to Jeremiah, yeah. then probably that threat would have gone away, yeah. so... Probably the greatest threat was um, what was within them among, among themselves. Yes. Yeah. Their own yeah. moral integrity. Yeah. Okay. Well, what about us? Has God made any promises to us? <coughs> May I remind you of Matthew twenty-eight twenty? 
and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. The end of the earth. Isn't that basically what he promised Jeremiah? What does that mean? You I tell mean, me. We find out a little later that it seemed like Jeremiah was kind of alone. He ended up down in some dungeon and mud pit. You think that could happen to us? Yes. yes. Well, but the question is, what does it mean I am, <laughs> I am with you? What part is he? Where is this well, big iron pillar and I, this big wall I, of bronze and all of that stuff? What? Shall I give you the ultimate example? It would be the case of Job. Go on. Was God with, was God with Job? Sometimes I think Job was more with God than God was with Job. <laughs> Uh, God put limits on the devil. God was behind there. Mm -hmm. I don't recall that Jeremiah and Isaiah and some of those other guys ended up with a whole lot more children than they had before and a whole lot more riches. And mm -hmm. What does it mean when he says, I will be with you? He says that a lot. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, well we're assuming that uh, when he's down in the dungeon in the pit that, that he wasn't dealing with it very well because it was, was pretty bad, but he might have been dealing with it pretty well because the Lord was with him. Jeremiah so. survived a lot. They tried to kill him several times. They whipped him several times. Threw him in the dungeon, threw, threw him in that fit. Handed off the kings here and there and some of the higher men and they uh, told him one thing and did others. I mean, he... So is, is what that means is You're going to go through a lot of very uncomfortable things, but yes, that's right. But we'll make it. Is we'll that make what, it. Is that what it means? Mm -hmm. so, well, there might be a strength that's going to be there that you wouldn't have if you got whipped. I mean, if you got, if you didn't have it when you were whipped, you would have a different outcome than if you had it and been whipped. What What is important here for Jeremiah? If well, God is going to be with him then it's well, for some kind of a strength. Yes. What, what, Basically what? what's going to happen is this. God is going to ask Jeremiah to stand up and speak very uncomfortable words to a lot of people in powerful positions and a lot of people, I mean like in front of the temple. Anybody who comes to the temple gets to hear Jeremiah's message. And I mean, you know, we live in a time where if you say something naughty to somebody, he can whip out a gun and shoot you. I mean, think about that. Martin Luther had some interesting words to say about Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he said, was a sad prophet who lived in a deplorable and difficult period. And what is more, his prophetic service was extremely difficult as he was struggling and fighting with a bad-tempered and stubborn people. Apparently he did not, by the way, did uh, Martin Luther have a very friendly attitude toward Jews? Martin Luther had an interesting experience when he realized the wonderfulness, the, the salvation potential of the gospel. He was so excited about it, he just thought that everybody who should hear this gospel should be just, just jumping up and down. And so he pre started presenting it to the Jews and they weren't and he, he was ready to throw them all in the River Elbe and so forth like that. Well, apparently he did not, he's talking about Jeremiah, apparently he did not achieve much success because he experienced how his enemies became more and more evil. They tried to kill the prophet several times. They pressed hard against him, whipping him uh, several times, yet he would live to see with his own eyes how his country was devastated and his people taken into exile. Ellen White comments, for 40 years, Jeremiah was to stand before the nation as a witness for truth and righteousness in a time of unparalleled apostasy. Unparalleled apostasy. What does that mean? In that case, just what it says. <laughs> <laughs> Unprecedented. <laughs> now, things were bad. I mean, it had really bad. So maybe that's what that means when he's going to be with him, that that no matter what comes, he's going to be there to give Jeremiah the strength to be what Jeremiah believes that he should be. But Jeremiah did a lot of crying. Yeah. 
Well, would you do a lot of crying? Uh, absolutely. In a time of unparalleled apostasy, he was to exemplify in life and character the worship of the only true God. I mean, you can't even go, you couldn't even go to church, into Solomon's temple, and worship the way you were supposed to because everybody else was doing crazy things there. During the terrible sieges of Jerusalem, uh, you know, how do we know that? Remember the visions of Ezekiel? He was carried in vision back to Jerusalem and there were people worshiping the Queen of Heaven oh. in this corner and somebody else is doing something else over in that corner. And Wow. Then, then today we have a church calls refers to the Queen of Heaven as something to be. Yeah. It was the norm. Mm. What was going on, they'd been doing it so long and so deeply, it was the normal way of life for all. He was to be, Jeremiah was to be the mouthpiece of Jehovah. He was to predict the downfall of the house of David and the destruction of the beautiful temple built by Solomon. And when imprisoned because of his fearless utterances, he was still to speak plainly against sin in high places. Is it easy to speak against sin in high places? Of course, there's plenty of biblical passages <clears throat> to uh, indicate that uh, the house of David was going to be around forever. Yes. And the um, temple would never be destroyed, and they were going to be the we're conquering. We're going to talk about that. The conquering. We're going to find out there was a time when, you know, the Babylonians are on their way, and what are the Jews saying? God will never allow this temple to be destroyed, so the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, we just stick close to the temple of the Lord, and we'll be fine. So it's no wonder they thought Jeremiah was a kook. Of course. Despised, hated, rejected of men and women, he was finally to witness the literal fulfillment of his own prophecies of impending doom. Why did they even pay any attention to him at all? A lot of them didn't. You know, why did the king... Why Bother with all his writings? Yeah, right. Why did he just... This guy's a... Because it was pretty obvious that he was speaking for God. It's a little worrisome, isn't it? Evidently not enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, he, he, he was to share in the sorrow and woe that should follow the destruction of, that fate, of the fated city. Prophets of Kings 4, 8, paragraph 1. Look at Jeremiah 1, 17 to 19 again. Get ready, Jeremiah. Go and tell them everything I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them now, or I will make you even more afraid when you are with them. Listen, Jeremiah, everyone in this land, the kings of Judah, the officials, the priests, and the people, will be against you. But today I'm giving you the strength to resist them. You'll be like the fortified wall, the iron pillar, the bronze wall we talked about. They will not defeat you, for I will be with you to protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. It's, in, in Jeremiah's experience, are there any messianic overtones here? Are Absolutely. there any, when Jesus read the story of Jeremiah, was there anything that he saw that that was an indicator what his <clears throat> life was going to be like or when they asked the when Jesus asked the disciples that you know who do people say I am one of the one names that's mentioned is Jeremiah yeah absolutely well did did Jeremiah know immediately when God spoke to him oh yeah that's God talking to me go ahead God <laughs> Is that how it really worked? I'm asking you. Well, you just, you just acted it out, and I'm asking you, is that how it worked? Well, let me give you an example. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. <coughs> In those days when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, remember Eli was one of the ancestors of Jeremiah, there were very few messages from the Lord, and visions from him were quite rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. He's sleeping there in, in, in the temple. I mean, in the, in the temple of those days. Sounds like the most holy place. Yeah. Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel. He answered, yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, you called me, here I am. What did th who did Samuel think was calling? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Eli answered back. I didn't call you, go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know that it was the Lord because the Lord had never spoken to him before. 
So he got up, went to Eli and said, you called me and here I am. But Eli answered, my son, I didn't call you, go back to bed. Then the Lord called Samuel the third time. He got up, went to Eli and said, you called me and here I am. Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling to the boy. So he said to him, go back to bed. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak, your servant is listening. I can imagine. You suppose he was a little bit. <laughs> and so. Which is interesting in that he didn't shy away from. He didn't, he didn't say, oh my goodness, I'm undone or I'm not qualified. No. It's interesting. I think it was, I, I think it was too green to know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. I don't well, it said there that he didn't know it was God because he didn't hear him before. Yeah. So your question to Jeremiah might be that he's heard him before, and that's why Well, I'm he asking can, about the first time. The first time he heard him. The very him. first time. Yeah. The very first. When do you think that is? I, I don't know. I'm was just, it maybe it was in the womb? <laughs> no, I think that would be a little too early. You think so? Well, well, I guess I'm not going to worry too much <laughs> unless I hear... Some kind of a voice in the night, or nice. a bright light, or I'm sure you didn't need well, something. Well, let me just ask light. another question. <laughs> carries great. Jeremiah immediately, and, and and also Moses and Isaiah felt they were not qualified to do this job that God was asking them to do. Did their feelings of inadequacy <clears throat> disqualify them, or qualify them better? Qualify them better. Yes, in the long run, it did. Because you know where the the message is coming from. Okay. So you think if they said, yeah, God, go ahead. What would you like me to do? No, I don't think they would have done that. Well, would, I, think, would I think it's because they were young that, mm -hmm. that they responded that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were very respectful of older people because of their wisdom. So here, in our, would, here in our conversation, I'm thinking after becoming acquainted with all of these prophets and how they responded. If I hear a voice in the night, well, I'm going to say, okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And so I'm, I'm not hesitant here, so that disqualifies me? I, I'm just asking. I'm, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 if you knew for sure it was God calling, I mean, look at the experience of Ellen White. She didn't think she was qualified. In fact, she didn't even understand what was going on when she first did her, got her visions. Well, reality, you probably aren't qualified. The qualifications kind of come as you go along. And I would, my, my response would be, does God have the capacity to qualify you? My answer to that is he must think you've got some internal gift or strength that he can use, mm -hmm. being that he knows everything about you. Which makes you kind of wonder, what, you know, what was the great spiritual gift of Jonah, for Pete's sake? Yeah. <laughs> Must have been a powerful preacher. Yeah, maybe that's what qualified him. But none of them were perfect people. They all no. were fallible. Mm -hmm. So I guess it makes us, we all, we all have a Make us feel good in that sense. How come? Uh, how come everybody doesn't hear a voice in the night? Have you heard well, any voices in the night? <laughs> no. Maybe. My, well, well, not that kind. End up in cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim, have you heard any voices in the night? No, not that I can report on. <laughs> so well, Jeremiah's call in chapter one here is divided into three sections. There is the first section which talks a little bit about his background, his ancestors and so forth. There's a second section that talks about his call and the visions he saw, Jeremiah 1, 4 to 16. And then there's God's promises. Um, what do those sections say to us? Well, it, it, it suggests in, in each one of these cases, when God speaks, he doesn't, attend, he doesn't intend for us to sort of go back to sleep. You know, when, when God speaks, things happen. Um, 
And if we, in, in, right in the same chapter, look at Jeremiah verse four, 1, verse 4. The Lord said to me, verse 11, uh, The Lord asked me, Jeremiah, what do you see? I answered a pot. Jeremiah 13. Then he spoke to me again. I mean, he's pretty certain that God is talking to him, right? Did Jeremiah ever speak to any of the other nations? He said, I'm going to make you a prophet to the nations. Do we have evidence that he spoke to any other nations? Don't think so. Well, at least not that it's been written down. Yeah. He had to write it twice, remember, the first time he got cut up and thrown in the fire. So one of the things, and we're not going to have time to discuss this in depth, but there in Jeremiah 10, he, he was told, okay, Jeremiah, you're going to uproot, to pull down, to destroy, and to overthrow. Are those good things or bad things? <laughs> it depends on who it's happy, happening to. <laughs> to the depends who it's happening to. <laughs> well, yeah. and then he's told to build and to plant. Will those be good things or bad things? See, it seems like there are four bad things and two good things, right? Well, it depends if you look at it. If you have a farmer, you clear the land and you yeah. do all the bad stuff, which is pull out all the stuff, mm -hmm. and then you plant the seeds. So you could look at the whole thing as good. Okay, that's a possibility. Well, what does God tell Jeremiah to do right away? Gird up your loins. Mm -hmm. That's a good biblical phrase. What does it mean to gird up your loins? Get ready. Get ready <laughs> there are places well, people they, do that literally. They, they wore those long robes, yeah, yeah. and they, uh. they, apparently they had a way of sort of raising them up and tying them around their tummy or something like that mm -hmm. so they, they could run. Yeah. They could move fast without any delay or whatever like this. Mm -hmm. Basically, he was saying prepare for war, right? Yeah. Yeah. Prepare for war because it's going to start. Well, what about us? Is God saying something like that to us? I haven't heard any voices. So we can, we don't, we don't, we're not a part of the great controversy, so we don't have to worry about it? Maybe do. Well, we're running out of time, but <laughs> I think we're at the critical, one of the critical points in the great controversy, and God, as we read from the Ephesians 3 in some previous lessons, God is expecting us to be a witness not only to the people around us, he's expecting us to be a witness to the, to the universe. Our kind and loving Father, <clears throat> what a privilege it is to be called like Jeremiah. We would like to believe that we're trying to represent you the best we can here as we talk together. Forgive us if we have misrepresented you, but give us the insight to represent you the best we can is our prayer in Jesus' name.